Hi. So history, as we've mentioned before, is extremely difficult to teach simply because you're not only at best teaching it from the perspective of a few winners, but you're also in a position where you may not even understand what's not there. So because history tends to be written by people who are victors, in other words, whoever's left after the, after the war and after the destruction, you tend to, or simply whoever can afford to be noticed. It doesn't have to be quite as dramatic as war and pestilence and so on. Because history is, has been recorded by the literate throughout history during a time when most people were illiterate. By definition, what we've been taught has been only a small percentage of the human experience. So having said that, now that we have a different mindset and a different environment, it should be easier to teach history, but it's not because the vested interests involved are attempting to ensure that the history that is taught favors the same players who prevailed in the past. So that's the first problem. The second problem is, is once you start to really go back and try to include everyone's voices, you're dealing with so much data. <clears throat> in some cases, so much speculation that you really have to parse the propaganda from the truth, which is very difficult to do when you no longer have people you can interview or talk to to figure out how to put the data in context. So when I talk about inventing a Rosetta Stone so that we don't have to necessarily understand everything in order to decipher the overall picture, what I'm really saying is that we're never going to have, we're never going to be able to complete the puzzle, but because human nature has been fairly consistent over time, along with all of these vested interests over time, we can at least create a situation where you can figure out overall trends and then work your way backwards and create an understanding that can be transferred to the next generation. And the reason that we've been repeating history is not only because we haven't learned from it, because we couldn't learn from it, literally, but also because the same players, the ones who, including the teachers and the school boards who decide what history is taught, are essentially controlled by the vested interests of the past. And when there's a clash between the vested interests and newer players, typically two things happen. Uh, you know, one of them is a war, civil war, or just a war across borders, secession, countries split apart because they no longer have, they, don't, they no longer share a common narrative. But that's an extreme example. What really tends to happen is the dominant party simply jails or removes from the discourse whatever viewpoints are deemed to be threats. So that's one of the pieces of the Rosetta Stone is that when you go back and look at anyone who is deemed or who has been deemed a threat, you have to realize, you know, what are we, what are we really talking about here? What, what, what is that threat, whether it's communism, or Catholicism, what does it really represent? And why has it been deemed worthy by the establishment of being a threat? So we, we have to analyze history in that context. Within the United States, it's actually fairly easy to understand what happened here. And what happened here was a lot of Europeans came here, were stuck here, couldn't go back, or came here in search of greater opportunities, displaced the natives, and then did so in an effort to carve up the country for themselves and their vested interests back in Europe or with their trading partners back in Europe or 
in an attempt to create a an independent economic situation here, which would have to be based on farming, something local. And so you look at someone like Thomas Jefferson, you know, he wanted something local, he was not Catholic, none of the founders of this country were Catholic. And so for the most part, you were looking at farmers against commercial interests, and you had a lot of different currencies, because this country was originally envisioned to be independent from Europe, but not really because it had to have a source of income, it had to have some trade, and in order to do that, the only known tra trading partner would have been Europe. So you would be shipping cotton, you would be trying to protect the cotton, the British would be attempting to, with tea, you, the British would be attempting to, you know, um, put tariffs on certain imports within their empire against the Americans, or well, the wayward British cousins. And so you can see right away that this Boston Tea Party was an attempt by the local establishment to preserve their stream of income, probably against some competitors from overseas. And I, I don't remember anything about the Boston Tea Party that I was taught in high school, but now with that Rosetta Stone that I've gathered over the years, I now understand that you're dealing with a bunch of newcomers trying to create an economic independent existence within a structure of laws that favored the establishment, whether they're tariffs or otherwise. And this is true when you realize that, all right, so cotton was a major export. So in order to avoid tariffs, somebody came up with something I believe called poplin. I, I don't remember exactly the name of it because it's not common. Um, and yet, if you go to some places all over the world, you'll see that in order to avoid tariffs, a cotton substitute or competitor was created. So you have this constant struggle between the formal and the informal, the establishment and the anti-establishment, all of which is designed to either create a kind of harmony between the new and the old, or Absent that, secession, countries split apart, or war, or as I mentioned before, jail. Now, it turned out that the most successful countries in the world, China, Russia, the United States, all have a very high prison population per capita. In fact, the, the countries that have the highest prison population per capita are, are probably all the superpowers. Now, quote unquote, superpowers. And again, that's not a coincidence when, especially now when you have technology, you have the technology, you have to protect that technology from getting into the wrong hands in order to preserve your empire. That means that over time, the group of insiders has to become fewer in number as well as more loyal. So over time, when you look at history, at least you can understand what was really happening at the Boston Tea Party. And what was really happening here was a group of newcomers driven out by Catholic European corruption who came here and then decided to try to trade with others using tobacco, cotton, sugar, and probably, you know, a lot of other things that you could imagine before a services-based or technologically-based economy came into vogue. So when you think about the history of this country, you can see that suddenly you've got, in the southern part of the United States, you've got a hot climate, you've got a lot of land, you're going to be farmers on some level, so you're looking at cotton, sugar, and tobacco. Not just here, but all over the world. And of course, food. You can't grow your food, you die. I think I'm not sure if that's what happened in, in Jamestown. Um, but again, obviously farming would be the basis. Now, you go back in this farming, the people who used to be able to farm in this country, or still farm, uh, they were so successful, they were so useful that they continue to have, to, to be able to maintain their culture today. Same thing with construction. So you've got the Mennonites, the Amish, they've survived despite avoiding a lot of the technological advancements. Why? Because what they, what they knew, their expertise, 
was in something that was extremely useful before and today. So they were able to, because of their economic self-sufficiency, maintain their culture even from start to finish and ongoing, which is incredible. When you think about the Amish, the Mennonites, what, what they've done in this country, uh, they've been anti-war as this country has become more and more <laughs> uh, tolerant of overseas adventurism by the military. What they've done is incredible. And yet we don't hear about them. We tend to, th we tend to think of them as you know, weirdos, outliers, when in fact, when you understand them, remember, when you understand the people that are on the outskirts of history, you can actually worm your way back into the mainstream by understanding how they managed to survive outside of the mainstream for so long. Okay, uh, Christian science, by the way, by the way, it has to be religion because it, it wasn't as if in the old days you would have, you might have coffee shops and tea houses in China um, or in Asia, but for the most part, you know, the place to congregate would be a church. And that would, and those churches were for the most part affiliated with the government somehow, and to the extent they were not affiliated with the government, they would be shut down, driven out, defunded, etc. And we know that there's been interaction between religions, major ones, and the military, because if you go to the UK or Australia, every church, major ones that are still there, have monuments to the dead. Their names are written on the walls, the ones that died in World War I, World War II. They're on there on the walls, depending on what church you go to. And again, you can see that very difficult to maintain your place in history if you're not on board with the establishment. Unless you have a special skill that cannot be replicated or a skill that is essential. Look at all these things together. And of course the Amish and the Mennonites do not have in their churches monuments to the dead in war because they were pacifists. It used to be the Jehovah's Witnesses who are also pacifists, enjoyed a similar sort of motif, but I'm not aware of any expertise in farming. And in order to really study how certain religions prospered while others diminished, like the Shakers and so on, you can see that you have to go back and interview people, look at their historical documents and so on and so forth. The Christian scientists are very unique a female founder, you've got a, um, an avoidance of medical procedures because back in the day, now we know that the medical procedures back in the day were for the most part fraudulent or ignorant. So suddenly out of this, you had the Christian scientists who decided that they're just not going to believe or the doctors are going to come up with their own independent structure that prioritizes their own view of the data. You look at Islam, and this is where it gets interesting. I do have a point. You see an avoidance of chattel slavery, which allowed their military to be much larger than their competitions because there are always more, for the most part, until the vested interests take over, there are always more outsiders than insiders. In other words, the cool kids are always a minority numerically. And then because they're a minority numerically, they have to make the outsiders look bad or weird and so on. But if the outsiders all get together, it's not that the outsiders will be more, or sorry, less corrupt because they're all human beings. Remember, we're talking about human nature. What you're actually talking about is essentially a system that prioritizes people that have bought up real estate under a tax exempt structure and then built communities around that. Now, sometimes you can do that by aligning yourself with the government's aims. And sometimes you can do that by aligning yourself against the government's aims. But even the Mennonites and the Amish had to have the support of the local sheriff in order to avoid being drafted. And they had to move several times. You're looking at a, a lot of persecuted minorities. You look at all of this and you start to see that how did the Europeans who now consider themselves to be part of a colony in the United States, how do they survive when the climate was so hot and when they had to ship cotton, sugar, tobacco, and other essential products back to Europe in order to create some sort of 
economy for themselves while up against either <laughs> pirates and foreign navies. How do they do that? So the obvious answer is if you can drive labor costs to zero for the most part, you're going to have an advantage against people in other countries that have higher labor costs. And chattel slavery is obviously one way to diminish your labor costs and create an environment where you can undercut the competition while still functioning within this pre-existing legal scheme that favors the establishment. So you look at that and you see right away that you've got communities in the United States that prospered because when the Protestants came here, the anti-Catholics, when they came here, what happened was that they signed on to this, ex to this labor exploitation. And because they signed on to this labor exploitation, which was not necessarily based on, uh, well, it was based on racism, because once you start exploiting other people, whether the British Empire in India or otherwise, you have to create an empire that looks down on everybody who's not like you. So you go around and suddenly you can't exploit people unless you make them look bad or not like you. And that's the genesis of racism in this country. The Protestants came over, they saw what the Catholics were doing with their international, um, with their international empire, and they decided to sign on to the foundation of that empire, which was based on zero labor costs. In other words, chattel slavery. And when the Protestants did that, remember the, the idea behind the Protestants coming here was that they would be, they were against the corruption of the Catholic Church and the indulgences and nepotism in government. And of course, that's where you had the shift in the UK. The Catholic Church is no longer called the Catholic Church. It's called the Anglican Church. It looks like the Catholic Church in structure and hierarchy, but it's not the Catholic Church because it was essentially outlawed. Now they've gotten the churches back, um, but for the most part, they're operating under a different structure legally and otherwise. <sighs> so the Protestants say, we're coming all the way to America. We don't like the corruption that's happening in Europe because the Catholic Church is getting too much power. It's functioning in a way that is corrupt. We can't get a marriage license unless we pledge allegiance to the Pope. We can't do basic things that, you know, maybe not even get a birth certificate unless we are affiliated with somebody that is aligned with the dominant Catholic structure. And it's really interesting because at this point in time, you don't have, it could go either way. Thomas Jefferson in his letters talks about the Catholic Church with a small C. And he contrasts that to the idea of a republic. In other words, the idea of a republic is that you would prevent the kind of nepotism and single party structure that the Catholic Church had perfected in Europe that created this downfall in Italy and Rome, which, which meant that the, that the Holy Roman Empire had to move from Italy to Germany, where its corruption followed, it, followed its leadership, and as a result, led to the Protestant Reformation, which then worked, worked its way up into the UK. And then now you have all these splinter groups from Catholicism, you've got the Lutherans based on Martin Luther, you've got the Protestants, and then from that, you come over to the United States, and then you've got a lot of anti-war groups that now are founded here, because this country then moves into a more of a military-style economy from the beginning, in order to protect its shipments overseas against foreign navies. You go back and forth and you look at, why are we called a democratic republic? If you look at Thomas, Thomas Jefferson's letters, you can see that it was designed to prevent the kind of influence that the Catholic Church had created in Europe. Obviously, that's failed. We now live in a country in America where the Supreme Court, uh, the majority of people on the Supreme Court went to private Catholic schools, regardless of color. Um, you've, got in the, you've got a situation where the Speaker of the House and one of the branches on, of the legislature uh, is Catholic. The President of the United States is also Catholic. And you can see how you can contrast Catholicism with communism, but we'll get to that in Vietnam. That's really where it came to a head. And 
In other words, you can think of communism as opposition to the kind of single party dominance of the private economy in favor of a more inclusive government system that in general is opposed to the Catholic Church because both a central government and a centralized Catholic structure, the Catholic Church is centralized in a sense, it's got a hierarchy and so you're dealing with oppositions, right? There can only be one king and it's either going to be blessed by the Pope or not. And so communism would be an anti-Pope, an anti-centralized structure that would be against the influence of the Catholic Church and the historical vested interests that are surrounded the Catholic Church. And again, you can't have, you know, the kind of system that we've had here where there were no founders of this country that were Catholic. Suddenly, I'm now living in a city where the mayor is Catholic. The majority of the city council went to Catholic schools. The mayor won election against somebody who went to the same Catholic private high school, which now costs $40,000, $50,000 a year, uh, which is more than the average income, or even the, the median income of an, uh, of an American here today. Within that overall structure, so you've got local, state, and federal. All of them are now, if you live here, under a centralized structure that in the old days we would say was answerable to the Pope. That was the um, invective against Catholic political part candidates, that you don't, you don't respond, we're not interested in, in what's happening in the United States, you're not interested in what's happening here. You're, you're going to create a, a policy and a political structure that favors the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church and its international trading empire that goes all the way back to this country's inception and this country's original economy that was essentially based on slavery and elitism. And you go back and forth and then what you realize in, is, is that in those same letters that Thomas Jefferson wrote, he knew that slavery was wrong. He said that I tremble when I think God is just. And you look at that and you realize that these guys knew exactly what they were doing. They were smart enough. You, you sort of look back and say, well, these guys, maybe they, they might have been intellectually uh, intelligent in a, an abstract way. Maybe they didn't really know what was going on, but they had convinced themselves that, sure, these people are being exploited by us. But this is something, a sacrifice that we are willing to make in order to build a country. So suddenly the Protestants that came here in opposition to the corruption back in the Europe immediately almost created, uh, entered into a similarly corrupt enterprise that had links to the Catholic Church and its international economic empire, which was also based on slavery. Now we know that because you, specifically the word Negro in this country, which is what African Americans used to be called, now they're called black. Well, that should give you a clue. The word black, now it's with a capital B, used to be with a lowercase b, even though nobody calls <laughs> Asians yellow, either with a capital Y or a lowercase y. Nobody calls white people white with a lowercase y, a uh, lowercase w. But in this country, we used to call people Negroes because it's a Spanish word for black, negro. And as a result, that comes from, because it's pronounced differently, a lot of people don't realize where that word comes from. It comes from Spain, specifically Catholic Spain, which was engaging in a slave-based international economic system in opposition to the Muslims, which had outlawed chattel slavery from essentially from inception. That was the foundation of Islam. You can't have slaves, the prophets, first major act to put him up against the establishment was, for, you know, being against the, mer the merchants, the pre-Islamic Arab economic structure. And in, you can look up the story of Bilal, B-I-L-A-L. And, you know, you can go back and look at all these different things and you can see how you would have a crusade. You would have one of the popes, was it? I don't remember which pope. Um, but you can look up Dum Diversus. Dum, D-U-M, diversus. And that was an order by one of the popes that you could, in fact, enslave Muslims who were called Saracens, I believe, back in the day. The names change. The principles stay the same. And all of it is designed to maintain an economic empire that, again, has advantages over the formal structure because you're not paying anybody anything. You do, of course, have to invest, quote-unquote, invest in buying a human being. You have to pay somebody for the costs of transportation, 
and so on and so forth. But again, you're looking at a quote unquote lifetime of free labor, quote unquote free. It's really based on exploitation. So the inception of this country was the Protestants come here because they are upset with the corruption of the Catholic Church. They are intent upon creating a governmental system that removes the influence of the Catholic Church within the United States in the form of a republic. That all fails because they have to come up with an economy and the pre-existing players within that economy are linked to a global trading system all over the world that is based on a port-based system. You've got to ship materials somewhere from point A to point B. You're going to have to put it in a ship or a navy. You're going to have to have, even if you don't have a navy escort, naval protection in order to prevent pirates and so on and so forth. So you look at that and suddenly you realize that the Protestants did a fairly decent job in Europe. The Catholic Church's influence is still obviously in Europe, but in Germany it's restricted to the Saxony area, which has a lot of the pro-military structure from the United States over there. And it happens to be the most quote unquote conservative anti-immigrant structure a province within the entire country. Why? Because the Catholic Church wants to maintain its numbers within a, within a democratic system. And so it tends to favor people, immigration, but only when those immigrants are taken care of by the welfare arm of its own church that is funded by taxpayers. So when you talk, think about social welfare, why hasn't it worked? Why are so many people still poor when, when you have all this money in the world? It's because all that government money has been going through a corrupt system that goes back centuries. It is designed to favor, it is designed to attack a political structure founded in this, founded in this country to prevent overreaching by the Catholic Church. But if you have a system where the Catholic Church has history and experience in services like healthcare and education, when the government of any country is just setting up shop, you can see how the private sector in this country would create favorable alternatives to the public sector, especially when the entire country is founded on this idea of the government protecting international trade under a system that exploits international labor. So all of it starts to make sense. So once you remove the credibility of the central government, the private sector moves in, but the private sector has for centuries been dom dominated by a few players, multinational corporations, which are affiliated, affiliated with the military. And that funding, of course, is essentially unrestricted. No one's ever audited the military in this country effectively. When people tried, some lawyer or Congress passed a, an appropriations bill that was designed only to be used for short-term funding obligations. And now, of course, it's now essentially just a way to bypass creating a stable budget. So the lawyers have failed, which makes sense because Thomas Jefferson, all these people, was a lawyer as well. Uh, you look at all these people, Benjamin Franklin and so on, all of them thought themselves to be, hot, you know, cosmopolitan intellectually. And yet you could see that because their entire system was based on corruption and exploitation, you can see that it had a finite endpoint, especially if it had to create that exploitation or maintain it in, by denigrating the innate characteristics of other people, of other cultures and other religions. And they all knew, the founders of this country, what they were doing. I tremble when I think God is just. So I think we're starting to get a Rosetta Stone. We're starting to see why has there been, have there been so many wars between us crusades? Why, why has, has, there, has, there been, has there been so much conflict? Why has anti-poverty Why have anti-poverty programs failed so badly? And the answer to that question is a probably a separate chapter, but you can go back and look at the um, UN oil for food um, debacle 
and that's just one country that has a viable product that can be shipped and exported all over the world. And that's when you start to realize, wait a second, if, if a country like Iraq has oil and yet becomes totally corrupt under international supervision, what's going on? What's going on is you've got this oil that's in demand within a pre-existing structure that favors lawyers that can create rules as well as loopholes for their funders, for their backers, including, including in government. Most legislatures are lawyers, obviously judges are lawyers. By the way, that's again, you can see why police and law, <laughs> the executive, executive branches, you can see why they're in, in opposition to each other. You've got the cops against the lawyers, basically. The, um, and you can see why if under that structure, you can see why if the lawyers fail, you can see how suddenly you don't have due process. Suddenly you have a lot of police departments and, and you know, martial law systems becoming in vogue when the lawyers fail. So you put all this stuff together and you realize, we just talked about ports. Well, how do you get oil from point A to point B? You gotta ship it. And you've had to ship it for the last hundred years. In fact, Germany, under Adolf Hitler, was able to succeed spectacularly, and it was just beyond its wildest dreams, not only because it had access to some of the best, best scientists, which were later, you know, which later, who later came over to the United States, von Braun, and so on. But ultimately, when they took over Austria, not by force, the Austrians welcomed them in. Hitler was, born, was really Austrian, not German. Austria has oil. So suddenly Germany had access, the Nazis had access, the National Socialists had access to oil. At the same time, this resource was of course going to be scarce because of the war effort. Now, of course you can see the seeds of that, the knowledge that, wait a second, this one product is going to be responsible for success. You could see how that would eventually lead to Operation Ajax, and again, an extension of military might all over the world in order to preserve access to that resource based on a port system. Again, I do have a point. What is this port system? Who is in charge of the, all these different ports, all the different regulations? And because of all the lawyers have failed, nobody can figure out, I guarantee you, no one's going to be able to figure out, you know, <laughs> on his own or her own, how to get an oil shipment from the port of Los Angeles to the port of Kobe, Japan, even if they try to study the issue on their own for years. And there's probably, you know, multiple players involved and so on and so forth, multiple forms. And all of that can be bypassed by a single security branch officer that says, I'm going to hold up your shipment. I'm not coming through. I just decided it's not safe. So what's the lesson there? You can have all the lawyers you want. Lawyers can even be honest, but one low-level security officer can hold up the entire shipment based on a claim of security. That's how the executive branch tends to increase its influence. So you can also see why the lawyers only have the legislative branches in conjunction with the judicial branch in opposition to the executive branch. You can see why they have to be of the utmost credibility, of the utmost integrity because all of them can be held up if the system is corrupt by the security apparatus within a country, not, which does not have to be intelligent, does not have to think long-term, can simply hold up a shipment until they get paid or bribe or suddenly they call an officer or their preferred attorney, which they might've appointed themselves um, through lobbying or governmental unions or governmental influence based on an unfunded, uh, unaudited military budget that includes black box funding, which you can't even audit or even look at unless you're part of an elite. You go about, you go back or, or have, and have security clearance. You go back and look at all these things and you start to see that a republic, simply the structure itself is not sufficient to prevent centralized corruption by pre-existing players. And you go back and look once you start traveling, you notice that all the cities that you know about are really either nearby ports or are ports. Think about just the United States. What cities do you think of when you think about the United States? Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York. What else? Miami. 
mean, just think of any major city. Okay, maybe not Chicago. Well, no, no, we think of Chicago, but it's not within that same pattern. Um, so, of course, because it's not within the same port-based pattern, you got railroads, another method of shipping things, right? It's all based on getting stuff from point A to point B. <sighs> you got the canals. You can see again with history why this, there were so many flashpoints regarding the Panama Canal and the Suez Canal and so on and so forth. It's all based on a port, on shipping things from point A to point B within a port-based structure. Um, every city, Kobe, you know about Kobe, it's a port. It's also one of the most, um, it's got, I guess, uh, modern cities in Japan. Obviously, we don't, I don't have to tell you this, Tokyo, right? It's gotta be a port. <sighs> you go back and look at all this, and you look at the executive branch, especially post, in, in the West, post 9-11, increasing its dominance over the other two branches. Because the other two branches lost credibility and integrity. They weren't able to do much. And that always happens in history. That's how you get, by whatever name they're called, National Socialists or whatnot. They're always going to be the AFD or whatnot. They're always gonna start as an offshoot of the dominant player, whether religious or political. And that offshoot, unless it finds a way to survive economically, is going to either fail or be marginalized because there are too many vested interests involved over a period of centuries. We know the lawyers have failed because of all these different shell corporations. You can't even tax anybody anymore properly uh, because you can't track the money. Even if you could track the money, so what? The military can just print money for itself because of this, of this loophole called appropriations, which nobody in Congress, regardless of political party, has, just, has reined in. And guess what? You can't really go back to a budget, not a stable or sustainable one anyway, because you've got all this debt and all these obligations that have built up over time that have to be paid. So within all this entire structure, the social welfare system hasn't worked because it's gone, it's been funneled through entities that are using that money to increase their own political influence at the expense of everyone else. That, that's a historical fact. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be religious based. It could be political based. Um, this happened in New York. Um, New York City originally banned the Catholic Church. And this country was originally anti-Catholic for a reason. And because it was anti-Catholic, it wasn't able to co-opt the international influence of the Catholic Church, which had more experience in, in essential things like, again, construction. You go back and look at Zocalo in Mexico, the construction looks stable, it's still there. So you have to have experience in order to do that. You look at, um, you look at obviously hospitals and so on and so forth. And you can see how if the government isn't directly involved in essential services, you can see how eventually whoever is pre-existing, who can also provide those services more, more efficiently, you can see how suddenly you've got a hollowed out governmental sector and then lawyers that are willing to protect the property of the private sector in order to further their own expansion under the name of efficiency. In other words, the private sector says, these guys in government are against us, and they were, absolutely, not just against Catholics, but against Jewish people and so on. Um, if you go back and look at it, and, and everybody, really, right? Everybody that wasn't part of the, uh, the WASP structure. And because of that, you had segregation. Uh, you had, which again, Another form of exploitation, which set the seeds for the death of George Floyd, which happened in one of the most segregated, segregated states in the entire country. Not a coincidence. Los Angeles, again, <laughs> LAPD became corrupt in part because it was trying to enforce segregation, informal, as that was tacked on to the formal segregation that happened in the past based on race. That goes all the way back to exploiting a certain group of people in this country under the international trade system, which is based on ports and providing security for those ports, which meant that if you wanted to have a centralized system, you had to be pro-military, and, and unless you were able to be economically self-sufficient, in which case you were marginalized, like the Amish and the Mennonites. So all that should take you to 
another lesson, which is that, which is fake news. Why do we have fake news? It's because all the information you get from the mainstream is tied into these political structures based on exploitation that cannot be unwound unless you somehow can write a check for trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars. And we just passed a stimulus package for $1 trillion. I remember growing up when a billion dollars was a lot of money. And now we're dealing with, with over a trillion dollars in order to maintain the structure. So you go back and forth, back and forth, the new versus the old under this international trading system. And you ask yourself, what can be done? We can't unwind all these the different things. What can be done? Well, libertarians say that, well, because these laws are clearly used and manipulated by the dominant class against newcomers and minorities, we, the libertarians, we want to create, we just want to do away with them. And that's not going to work because, you know, that's, that's never something that I've advocated. Um, I've advocated the most, the fewest laws that create the most efficiency, the most efficient system. So you have to have some laws, especially with respect to what are called external, what's the economic term, externalities. So you have to regulate anything that can cause a major environmental impact, oil companies, banking especially, uh, and um, those would be, would be the top two. Now, what are the two industries that are really not very well, that are regulated but not effectively regulated? Banks and oil. Again, based on the adherence to an international trading system rather than a domestic trading system. So if you wanna, wanna create a system where you try to regulate these international entities, whether it's the Catholic Church, which can just bypass uh, taxation uh, and then probably hire lawyers to shield assets uh, all over the world because it's got those contacts all over the world as, a, as an international enterprise, if, a, if one country tries to regulate an international arm or an international or multinational structure, it's going to fail. They'll, they'll just move their money someplace else. Money is abstract. It can go anywhere. Labor is not mobile. Capital is. And so the reason lawyers have failed is because they haven't understood economics. They haven't understood that if I want to regulate, I need the cooperation of other governments all over the world. If I don't get the cooperation of these, of these other governments, no matter what laws I pass, I'm going to fail because it's so easy to avoid any law that I create in this country when capital is mobile and abstract. It can just move somewhere else. And not only have I, in, not only have I failed within my country, I've made my country less safe and less prosperous because I, haven't, I don't understand economics. Suddenly somebody else is going to get access to that money. The whole country of Ireland is essentially a tax haven. We don't think of it that way. We think of these small little islands like the British Virgin Islands or, I don't know, Seychelles, I'm not sure, um, you know, all these offshore places, Cyprus. We think of, we tend to think of those countries when we think about offshoring. But really, when you look at the uh, double Dutch, when you look at all these strange tax structures that are legal, <laughs> it's countries like Ireland and Hong Kong and even Singapore come to mind. And you go back and look at all these different things and you ask yourself again, what can we do? So the libertarians can create a check and balance on the dominant infrastructure. By if they were, if they're able to do what the other two parties within this country have failed to do, which was understand economics, understand the law, and realize that it doesn't work unless both these systems have some measure of accountability that allows a form of efficient taxation that is then audited in a way that ensures that that money can be tracked within a system of, uh, that is transparent. I, I know that's wordy, I just made that up on the spot. So you have to think about what, do the, what does the dominant political infrastructure not have? It doesn't have integrity. It doesn't have transparency. It's got everything that's the opposite of all those things. How do you fix it? Well, you have to have somebody who's not part of those two structures coming in and operating independently as a check and as a, and as a balance. So you want to audit somebody? You can't get, a, you can't get anybody that's tied into this debt-based structure of international banks that's tied to international oil shipments, that's tied into an even older system of international trade, that's tied into an even older system of chattel slavery. You go back and look at all these things and you've got
a battle between the multinationals or supranationals and domestic governance. That's what we used to say when we said, this person is answerable to the Pope. That's what was meant by it. So within that structure, when we're creating this Rosetta Stone, you've got these anti-globalization forces that don't know what they're doing because they don't understand what I just talked about, which is you can't unwind the system. Now, you used to be able to. You look at the history of the Catholic Church, it includes what's called a jubilee, which is the wiping out of debt. This is it all happens before. The debt gets too much, you wipe it out. <sighs> well, you can't really, we can do that through a bankruptcy, but not really. Again, the costs of doing all these things have gone up dramatically, creating inequality. And it turns out that, you know, if you're going to go by a Catholic structure of globalization, you better look at Italy. What's Italy? It's one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, the Catholic Church controls the stock market mill, has obviously not only real estate interests, but stock market interests. You can't really figure out who owns what because it's tied into this international structure of laws. Um, that, that favor shell corporations and complex accounting. So you failed in Italy. In Italy. That's not a structure anybody wants. Uh, obviously, the mafia, right, was, uh, you know, dominant there for quite some time, not just in Sicily, but in you know, a lot of other places. Now, remember what I said. Who are the bad guys? Well, they're bad guys by the establishment, but in this case, remember, the mafia was able to get things done. So you couldn't, because the government was failing, or had become corrupt, you can see how some organization would promise anti-corruption measures, go in and create a better and more efficient system using violence to get things done. Because that's the only thing that can be done at that point, right? You've got a totally corrupt system, some clerk at the, at the docks won't sign off on something, you shoot them, take, take over the signatory authority, and suddenly things get moving. Violence can work if efficiency is your only goal. So you see how, again, when I talk about the mafia, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about really another international structure that was designed to create an alternative to an inefficient, even more corrupt system. And I, I once was, when I was in Las Vegas, I, I talked to a, a car dealer who said that, you know, this city used to run better when the mafia was in charge. Probably true. I, I don't doubt it. But again, you can see how that structure, that pre-existing structure that's based on corruption can benefit from an outside, an outside entity, we can call them libertarians or whatnot, who comes in and operates as a check and balance on even further corruption. So how do you do that? So that's really the question you wanna answer. Now, if you look at Italy, it's not doing very well. Germany, of course, has done well because it had a Protestant Reformation. <laughs> you can see how a lot of the countries that have done well have managed to do so because they've got strong governments and in order to have strong governments, they tend to correlate with a lack of Catholic representation. In other words, you don't need a private Catholic school in this city called Bellarmine if your government schools are doing just fine. No one's gonna pay $40,000 to go there if they can send their kids through a taxation system, <laughs> you know, through, by paying taxes, by, um, through a, a stable taxation system they, they can send their kids to public school, so they're functioning well. So you can see how in countries that have done well, Japan, you, you know, you, you can, Germany, you go back and look, London, um, well, London is a bad example, it's just another financial offshore. You know, we talk about Ireland, right? Well, what is London? Um, <laughs> it's another essentially legal uh, <laughs> outpost of the international financial uh, paradigm. But it's done well for itself. You know, it's, it's taken those investments. Remember, the, 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 <laughs> we have these names that we think are bad, the mafia and so on. But if, if certainly when you don't have transparency, when capital is moving around, you're going to end up with inflation, right? The money has to go somewhere. It can't go into legal structures. It goes into property. And that's not just the Catholic Church. That's the mafia. That's everybody that's trying to offshore money. They put it in tangible things. Um, or now it's services, which is, which is even harder to track. How do you track whether or not somebody, some consultant was paid $10 million. Um, how do you track whether or not that work was worth $10 million? How much governmental <laughs> IRS influence do you really want in the micromanaging of a company's books? So you can see how you have all these different structures. Now, what if you had somebody from the outside going in without any allegiance to 
the dominant political structures. Instead, all right, this person, this consultant got paid $10 million for Enron, show me the work. Well, I don't think that's worth $10 million. You can, we're not gonna take the money back. There's not gonna be a clawback, but you know, you're not gonna get the full deduction. You know, how do you do that? You can only do that if you have integrity. And these days, you can only do that if you're not tied to the dominant political institutions. That includes almost everybody. So why do we have fake news? Because mainstream news has always been fake. The only news that has been honest and real has been from, the out, from outside the mainstream. So who was correct about the Vietnam War? It was a nation of Islam. Not even a, you couldn't even call them a real Islamic group. Um, you know, Malcolm X changed his name, the name that was given to him by Elijah Muhammad when he went to Mecca. Uh, he called himself El Hajj Malik Al Shabazz. El Hajj is probably, you know, it just means I've, I've taken the trip to Mecca and now I fulfilled the five pillars of Islam. So his, Malcolm X became Malik El Shabazz. So he actually went away from the nation of Islam when he found quote unquote true Islam. I'm not putting down the nation of Islam. I'm just saying that you, you can't look at names to figure out where, where to go. You have to look at the Rosetta Stone doesn't care about your name. It cares about activities and patterns and history that are tied to human nature. And Malcolm X, all the things I've read about him, he, because, he, because he didn't have access to, even though Puerto Ricans were nearby in his neighborhood, he didn't have access to the Spanish language. So he didn't, wasn't able to make that connection between the word Negro and Negro and the Catholic Church, even though he was against the Catholic Church. He talks about how all countries that have, in, 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 in an interview with Playboy, he talked about how every country that has lapsed into a dictatorship has been Catholic. Um, you know, Catholicism, he said, promotes dictatorships, is what he said. Uh, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, which, again, kind of makes sense if you, you know, don't consider the Pope to be, uh, whichever one, to be a, a, an adequate representative of that international empire of real estate, tax exempt, and otherwise, and shell corporations, and so on. And so you go back and look at this, but that was, again, <laughs> on the outside. Who was right about the Vietnam War? Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. Total minorities. I mean, uh, you couldn't come up, I mean, in a sense, right? Because we know that Malcolm X was, ta was protected by, uh, by an undercover police officer. That didn't work. Um, we know that uh, from New York, by the way, NYPD, I believe. And you go back and you look at um, Muhammad Ali, who was supported originally when he was Cassius Clay by the Louisville establishment, which included police officers and included the lawyers in Kentucky that protected him, white lawyers. And Muhammad Ali knew they had integrity because he told the Nation of Islam, do not mess with these people, leave them alone. He kept the old establishment while moving into the arms of the new establishment. That's what made Muhammad Ali so successful. He wasn't really racist. He would talk about, you know, segregation. He would talk about the talking points of the, of the, of the Nation of Islam. But that was all in opposition to <laughs> de jure segregation. In other words, when you put somebody under a corrupt legal system, in many cases they say, I don't want to be part of your system, screw you. And <laughs> I'll come up with my own system of economic self-sufficiency. And that's what the Nation of Islam, that's why they were able to survive despite having a deeply flawed philosophical agenda because they were economically self-sufficient. So, you go back, you look at all these different things, you start to see that, how is it that this tiny splinter group that wouldn't even be recognized as Islamic by any scholar, how, how is it that this tiny splinter group was, a, was able to outclass intellectually the Rand Institute, all the military's top commanders, the political infrastructure, Henry Kissinger, all of them, Vice President of the United States, Humphrey, all of them. How is it that they were able to get either the match or exceed their opinions about Vietnam despite having such a small footprint across the entire nation? And again, it's because if you recognize the mainstream has always been corrupt because it's based on exploitation, and a globalized structure that has to be reined in. You recognize that the minority viewpoints are perhaps the only viewpoints that matter if the truth is what you're seeking.
when we help me talk about minorities you realize that we don't really have them in the united states anymore um you know we've had this idea that the establishment has recognized that it's on the outskirts that it's lost credibility and that minorities are the only ones speaking the truth so what did it, what did it do for the last 20 years it started promoting minorities to the top everywhere corporations uh politics obama etc while maintaining the underlying corruption and because human beings are so visual <laughs> we've been fooled and yet we don't really have another malcolm x right we don't really have someone like him anymore and why is that because overall you've got a structure in place that is still totally corrupt because it hasn't really unwound anything and it can't unwind anything within all these different international global structures. And to the extent that it wants to unwind anything, you've got maybe a 2008, 2009 crash. So again, I go back to this idea of an independent outsider coming in and truly exerting on the dominant structure a type of independent analysis. And you can see how that's only going to work for a time. Eventually, if it gets successful, it'll be co-opted by someone else. It'll become, it'll lose its minority status as more and more people join. And that's always been the problem, but that's, you know, that's a nice problem to have in the future. But you can see how, because of these different structures in place that have been maintained by the lawyers who have failed, thereby giving the executive branch more and more influence, which never works out, long term, only short term, you can see how the future is no longer in this country, unless they do add on a libertarian type of check and balance. And you can see how it's starting to happen. You've got this movement towards a um, universal um, global tax of 15%, which is a good tax rate to have. It's you know, not, too, not too low and not too high, which you know, disincentivizes offshore accounts, because you know, it is expensive in, in a sense to maintain two sets of books. Uh, not only because of crime, it's because, just because it is difficult to, you know, deal with. Not, not only because of the possibility of jail time under prosecution, but, you know, it's difficult to just maintain that kind of um, subterfuge over a long period of time without, you know, and, and still be efficient. So you put all these things together and remember that Muhammad Ali worked out because of the police. Remember that he had both the old and the new. That should be part of our Rosetta Stone. How do you keep the old and then also maintain the new. Um, that's, that should be part of the analysis. And I think it's gonna be hard because, think about it, right? LMPD, Louisville Metro Police Department, is now probably not as honest as it was before, right? You've got the death of Priyana Taylor. Uh, you've got a lot of issues within Louisville which produced not only Muhammad Ali, a black, a, an African American, uh, but also Hunter Thompson, a uh, white male both of whom were the best in their fields. And I don't know, you know, one thing we, we try to do is be superficial. We try to change. We went from Negro, who we Negro to Negro to black. But, you know, no one's walking around, you know, to African American. No one's wanting them back to black. No one's talking about Caucasian Americans, right? Um, again, that's because of slavery. You know, you can actually pinpoint and say, well, I'm not a Caucasian American, I'm Italian American. You can pinpoint where you came from. You can't do that if, you're, if, if your history involves chattel slavery. So that's why that one group has always been on the outside, linguistically and otherwise. They don't have access to that global structure that everyone else had access to, whether formal or informal. And because of that being you know, outsiders, that minority status, the reason that minorities were so respected in this country before the establishment took over this idea of co-opting minority visual status, you know, they were able to get closer to the truth. And you don't, right now you get the sense that if you can just buy off all the minorities, then everyone's happy. And with a trillion dollars, you can probably do that. You can probably buy off almost all the minorities. And that may be what's happened in this country. And I don't know if that's, I don't know how that's going to work out in the future. But again, if you're trying to come up with a Rosetta Stone, you're going to have to try to come up with different pieces that all of us put together that involve some sort of acknowledgement that the, of history and of human nature. And it's going to have to probably come back to a separation of the military and the police. It used to be that police could not get drafted. So because they could not get drafted uh, as an essential 
part of the uh, local government. They were given an exemption for the Vietnam War. Now that didn't help make them, you know, less corrupt in Chicago. They were beating anti-war protesters in Chicago in the Democratic National Convention under a Catholic, under a Catholic Richard Daly, the mayor of Chicago at the time. You go back, you start to see that if you have to have an honest police department that's not tied to the military. How do you do that post 9-11 in this country where the military and the police have become more and more aligned, where veterans hiring preferences give, in some cases, even more power to the military to corrupt local institutions. Not just because of artificial preferences, but also because of the fact that you're now dealing with an unaudited and therefore unlimited budget. So you go back to the police and you realize that you can't have a Muhammad Ali without the police. They're going to have a security infrastructure that is against military adventurism, like in Vietnam, like in Iraq, and like in Afghanistan. You're going to have to have the same kind of lawyers and the same kind of police officers in Louisville, Kentucky, in a time of segregation. Now remember, it was segregation in the South. Separate but equal is what Muhammad Ali grew up in. And yet, he was just fine. Why? It's because despite these laws, the executive branch was honest and had integrity. And ironically, so did the military at the time. Remember, this is post-World War II? Yes, we're in Vietnam, but we don't, haven't quite gotten the lessons of Vietnam or Korea. And so where did Muhammad Ali train? In a gym that was frequented by both the military and the police together. There's always been an a informal affiliation. It doesn't have to be a formal one. That gym was run by a local police officer, Jeff Martin. Sorry, jo Joe Martin. Not a coincidence. Informal ties, formal separation, the integrity of the local institutions remains intact. It's not the case today. After 9-11, you put all these things together and you realize that you probably have to start with another political party that has integrity, or at least it doesn't even have to be a political party. It just has to be some independent unit that can show results through auditing and through other methods in order to restore the credibility of the judicial branch and the legislative branch, as well as the taxation authorities as well as so you move away from a debt-based system that is fueling all these, all this military expansion and all this corruption, away from the power of the, of the individual on a local level. Put all that together, you need some sort of outside entity with integrity that understands history and economics. You also need some sort of protection on a local level that is honest and not corrupted by foreign or national influence whether they're military or otherwise. You put all that together and you at least have a starting point. If you are a libertarian or you call yourself some other name, you can come in, look at the laws and see whether or not the laws are creating their intended purpose. And if all you're gonna do is pass a law like Sarbanes-Oxley that is supposed to make all these multinational corporations more honest, and yet if you've got the same accounting shenanigans that you had before, you can see that Passing the law doesn't really work because the lawyers on the other side will simply find a loophole. And they'll find a loophole because they'll go back to the, they'll get the lobbyists to complain to a congressman or a congresswoman or a state legislator and say, this law isn't working. Give me an exception. Give me an exemption. And by the way, of course, we'll vote for you as always. Put all that together and you've got to have someone like the CBO. And what <laughs> The Congressional Budget, Budgetary, Budget Authority. So, um, sorry, actually Congressional Budget Ombudsman. And you know, right now as, as we're passing, this is how low things have gotten in this country. Um, as we're passing and negotiating this trillion dollar budget, you know, a minority of, legisl of legislators um, have said that, wait a second, we wanna see the impact of this on long-term, these long-term fiscal projections, how much is this really gonna cost? And let's wait for the CBO to issue a report. One of the response to that by the people that just want to get things done has been, uh, was, no, none of my constituents cares about the CBO. In other words, let's go ahead and maintain the structure. Who cares about the long-term impact? That's what's going on in our legislature today. And it passed. At least part of the bill passed. 
I guarantee you nobody knows what's in it. When you have a trillion dollars, how do you audit a trillion dollars of spending, of governmental spending? How do you do that? And that's on top of the COVID stimulus packages that were passed before, of which the Catholic Church got about a billion dollars because it was got an exemption uh, <laughs> from the typical uh, limitation on spending, on receipt of, the, of that stimulus. You go back and forth, you start to see that there's always been a battle between the foreign and the, and the domestic and between the lawyers and the, and, and the executives. How do you move away from that and yet maintain the structure of the old and the new, just like Muhammad Ali?